Julian, in your mind, what is complex care housing and why does our place champion it? Complex care housing is a, is, a, is a kind of housing that doesn't really exist at the moment where folk who can't sustain and retain uh, other forms of housing for reasons of uh, profound and severe mental health and addiction challenges, that they can go and find a home and be housed and get the, the clinical uh, support and professional support that they need that workers in, um, in mainstream shelters and transitional housing and supported housing simply not qualified to give and that they can get the care that's loving and healing and trauma-informed and culturally sensitive and culturally safe as well. So not an institution, not a hospital, but a home but a home that recognises that people have complex care needs and meets those needs. And what difference would you say that complex care housing will make to the people on the street and who do you see it being most useful for? You know, I think it will make a huge difference for a small group of people who are so profoundly unwell with their addictions and or their mental health that uh, they really have been kicked out of pretty much every housing situation they've ever had, any shelter situation. They're typically barred from most agencies for behavior related to their mental health and addictions. And they kind of wander our streets, usually by themselves, uh, in, 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 in a kind of high degree of distress uh, and exhibit behaviours from screaming and hearing voices and undressing themselves in public and threatening people, threatening themselves. Uh, it, you know, in such ways that it's really alarming for people to witness and, and can be very uh, fear-inducing as well. And, you know, they, they, they frighten people and indeed they do, but they're very vulnerable and they're more of a danger to themselves in that when they are so unwell that they're vulnerable to attack themselves, to violence. Uh, the women in particular are vulnerable to sexual exploitation and I've, I'm very aware of many instances of women being appallingly abused uh, who are in that situation. So to provide those folk with a, with a safe harbour and a place of refuge I think uh, really makes a huge difference because it, it, it reduces that vulnerability significantly and it gives them access to a home, it gives them access to a, a safety, it gives them access to healthcare and services that they are not getting on the street. And by not getting them, uh, they are vulnerable and also slowly dying, frankly, on our streets. I think a, a question that the public would want to ask is, how do you balance the needs of the individual against their right to refuse treatment? Absolutely, I think that's a really important question. And you know, I, I am someone who spent my working life fighting for people's rights and, 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 uh, and advocating around issues related to civil liberties. Um, but I also recognize that there are folk who are so unwell that they really are not in a position to make a choice or to make an informed decision. Uh, and that because they can't do that, uh, they are also, again, vulnerable because they're in that state. And that I think there are other rights that then come to play. And I think that's you know, their right to be safe, which we all have in this country, the right to be housed the right to health care and an appropriate health care and I think by creating these places and even bringing some people in involuntarily because they're not in a position to make a, a choice for themselves I think it's our society's responsibility on their behalf to make that that informed decision for them by bringing them into that situation we can um, help them stabilize and get well and be on a path to some a, a much better life and indeed in some instances literally save their lives because they are so vulnerable to the kind of violence and abuse that will 
either end their lives quickly or slowly, but either way, it will end their lives prematurely. And I think you've just touched on, on this, but um, so you, you, would you say that complex care housing will save lives? Absolutely. Uh, I, I have no doubt about that. I've seen people literally dying on the streets over a period of time who have really been barred from everywhere, won't go anywhere, won't go to hospital treatment even if they need it because of some of the experiences they've had. Uh, you know, people disappearing off the streets as well. Uh, no one knows where they went because they were so vulnerable. God knows what happened to them, one can only imagine. So I've no doubt that this would, uh, this, this care, even involuntary at times, would absolutely save some people's lives. And not only save lives, but more, I think as importantly, improve lives, give people a chance, another chance at life, you know, because the life that many folk who have profound and untreated mental health and or addictions, the life they have is, is really, is a miserable and forsaken one and often, and it's not much of a life by any standards. So, you know, by doing this, you not only necessarily save a life, but you give people their lives back, give them the chance to get well, get healthy, stabilize, and then own their life again and make decisions and choices uh, for themselves and uh, and to be in a much better place. And, you know, we've all seen that when people do get the appropriate treatment, how transformative that can be. And finally, um what would you say are the next steps to making this a reality? Yeah, I, I think the, the most important next step is that the government step up to support this. Um, we know that this particular BC government has invested and is investing huge amounts of resources in mental health and addictions finally, which is great to see because not all governments have done that. And I know that they're discussing the possibility of complex uh, care housing. And I, I hope that the next step is that they continue that discussion and that they broaden it out and they bring in a range of people to talk about the model for this, because we've got to get the model right and uh, have all the proper legal safeguards and boundaries and limits so that they bring the right people in to do that. And that they then, once they've decided on a model, which shouldn't take too long, you know, this should not be something stuck in committee for a year or two, that they they begin to implement that model and make the appropriate legislative changes as well to to, to do it. I think this is a uh, an initiative and a programming that a lot of people want. You know, we put a an op-ed in the Times columnist this week about this and been an extraordinarily positive response uh, to it um, from people who either went through this kind of situation themselves or had family members or people that they were working with, clients, and have seen through bitter experience the, the desperate need for for something like this. So I think if the government was to take that next step of committing to developing a model and implementing it, I think they would see enormous amount of public support. And I hope that they do take that next step to go down that road. Thank you. Anything I missed that you want to add? Nothing other than, you know, I, th I think it's important to see this as part of a continuum of mental health services. We have most of the parts of the continuum in place right now, but this is, seems to me to be a missing piece. And, and because it is a missing piece, there is this small group of, of very vulnerable folk who are, have really been abandoned to our streets. And uh, I think it's time now to, to, to provide the, the services and the, the care that they need uh, so that they can change their lives. And, we finally uh, get the help they, they need and lead the lives they can and want to.